Good afternoon, and welcome back to our continuation of the Wednesdays at the Center series on John Hope Franklin and global anti-racism. Today's presentation is titled Perspectives on Anti-Blackness in the Arab World. Please do remember to keep yourselves muted, but you can and keep your cameras on if you'd like, and share comments or questions in the chat for the Q&A portion. And now let us welcome Dr. Mohamed Haroun from the University of Botswana, who will serve as moderator and introduce our speakers. Thanks very much, uh, Julie, and thanks for the technical team at Duke for, uh, for this opportunity. And thanks to our panelists for having accepted the invitation. I think this is a hot topic, as we all know, uh, very important, very critical, uh, and at a critical time. I mean, coming from Southern Africa, as you know, uh, from South Africa more specifically, uh, where racism has been endemic, has been part and parcel of the system, structurally, uh, internally, individually, and so forth. So we've experienced the sort of nature of racism in our neck of the woods. But of course, the focus today will be as, as regards sort of anti-blackness uh, or racism within the Arab world. Of course, this is an hour meeting. So we are restricting uh, sort of um, the, the limit to basically 12 minutes for presentation. And we will leave the Q&A towards the end. So we'll ask to basically make a presentation and the other two colleagues will follow. Let's uh, get to our next presenter. Uh, Afifa Latifi is from Tunis and she's attached to Cornell University where she's specializing She's a post, uh, she's a doctoral candidate at Cornell in Africana studies uh, sector. And she also has demonstrated her interest in, in examining slavery and colonialism in North Africa. And uh, so she'll share with us her, her thoughts. Afifa. Thank you, Professor, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for this invitation. Um, so my presentation today, um, I wanted to share this one slide um, that I hope will sort of convey the main idea that I wanted to share with you today. Um, this is a photograph um, of a street sign uh, still hanging today on the, on the walls of the Medina of Tunis, also known as the medieval Arab quarter, which is one of the you know, many sites or spatial sites where it's um, where sites that it would be, where it would be really difficult to avoid similar interpelling vestiges of racial slavery today in Tunisia. Um, and this is, we can say that this forms some kind of like a troubling mund yet mundane violence um, of you know these encounters with this itinerant lexicon of um, transatlantic racial slavery that is uh, kind of further intensified for the Black Tunisian in particular, who beholds the Arabic translation of street names um, that not only rendered the violence that riddled the Atlantic lexicon of Black subjectivity legible, but also invoke the traumatic trans-Saharan um, Arab slavery that operated in Ottoman Tunisia um, and in the semantic of black subjugation to which this more ancient enslavement gave rise. So if you can see here, while the French inscription, especially of like the, the one on the right, uh, it's my right, inscription of Negre and Negresse uh, signals the still hegemonic episteme of transatlantic racial slavery um, they are homologous Arabic cognates of Abd, Ulsif uh, uh, in, in the vernacular, Arabic and Zanji in, in other culture, denote another enduring and a competing um, episteme of like trans-Saharan Arab slavery, which even though it preceded and outlasted the transatlantic slavery uh, history and history span and episteme, remains eclipsed as an explanation of black racialization by the overwhelming scholarly attention um, that has been paid to, to the transatlantic world. Um, and I'm here thinking about, particularly about countries like, um, a country like Mauritania, which was the last country to abolish slavery in 1981 and only criminalized the practice in 2007. So trans-Saharan uh, Arab slavery, which, or Ottoman slavery, we can discuss more about that later, uh, which lasted for 15 centuries in North Africa and the, and the Middle East remains yet under theorized as a normative experience of African dispersal and racialization today. And while its victims had outnumbered the 11 to 12 million uh, Africans who were severely displaced during the Middle Passage, the, the dearth of, of trans-Saharan slavery, historiography, and the scantiness of uh, its archives further um, obscure its centrality in the, in the global dispersal experience of Africa. So unlike transatlantic slavery, trans-Saharan slavery remains quite resistant to schematization without a beginning or an ending um, as it expands to the present moment to inform black subjectivities and engender 
uh, black death, both symbolic and material, in, in ways that um, render black, uh, local black North African experiences uh, of anti blackness global and uh, comparable in many ways to, to their um, uh, diasporic counterparts. So the distinction can be here imputed to this um, maybe dominant terminological and theoretical framework of the Atlantic paradigm that pushes it to the margin of the modern day discussions about slavery and race and anti-blackness. Um, and one cannot, of course, miss to mention the prevalent culture of denial that stunts research on the topic and um, or, in, or having um, authentic conversations about anti-blackness um, and its entanglement with trans-Saharan slavery. Uh, which explains this, again, this scantiness of the existing local literature on the practice or the general tendency to fit trans-Saharan Arab slavery against the horrific um, chattel slavery, um, all while attempting, of course, to use this apologetic discourse that almost upstalls the practice um, of, of trans-Saharan Arab slavery or Islamic slavery as this, uh, and, you know, shape in it or uh, trying to represent it as this paternal institution of a more humane and an intimate character. Um, but of course, such an erasure does not at all exercise this trans, um, the, the, the trans-Saharan racializing specters that manifest in like endless disguise today in the region. And today I wanted to mainly focus on this discursive practice of anti-Blackness um, and, and its language uh, as entangled with the semantic of slavery and service within the Tunisia and Rafa Kitam of the So um, there are of course variations, but the, the predominant language of anti-Blackness entangles pretty intimately with the history of slavery um, and the language of servitude and uh, bondage. So um, I wanted to, you know, to also kind of talk about the epithet of Sif, someone in the, I think someone asked about the, the meaning of Usif. Usif means actually servant. Um, it's also, it has another cognate used uh, in Tunisia, Shushan or Abd um, in North Africa and Middle East as well. Um, but, you know, Usif means servant, Shushan uh, and Abd maybe have different meanings. Um, but uh, the most, I think, prevalent one in Tunisia is actually Sif. Um, and somehow none of the, you know, all these anachronistic, uh, all this anachronistic or this uh, jargon, anachronistic jargon didn't fall into disuse today in contemporary Tunisia and North Africa. So although not always used with like malicious intent because of the general desensitization to the actual denotation of such violent language, um, these discursive practices still hold a heavy weight, of course, for Black North Africans. Um, now, while the slavery lexicon was historically meticulous, as it particularized the, uh, you know, the enslaved different social statuses and roles within shifting political and, and social structures of the past, um, the modern use of, of such diligent terminology tends to equate it with Black physiognomy. So it is this conflation of color um, and um, and 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 this past social status of enslavement that many Black Tunisians kind of continue to denounce today um, as they're consistently racialized as, as slaves and um, despite the colors meaning inferred through the popular taxonomy, the persistence of such vocabulary has a double effect on the interpolated Black subject who's offended by the anachronistic as well as this uh, contemporary con connotation that the epithet has acquired. So, which is basically the equivalent, you know, I mean, if we, if we can say the word we see for other terms, are, um, will have this, you know, uh, heaviness and this weight to them that makes them equivalent to the heaviness and to the to, of the n-word, for instance. Um, this terminology, of course, does not only reinvigorate the memory, as I mentioned, of servitude and perpetuate the essentializing of um, Black Tunisians as their descendants, but also gestures uh, at, at what exactly intimates this never fading historical event of slavery, which is uh, Blackness. Um, Although slavery was abolished in 1846 in Tunisia, which was of course only theoretical, uh, as slavery continued until uh, 1890 after the advent of the French, um, and who were of course involved in the continuing buying and selling of black slaves in the Mediterranean, uh, even after the official abolition of slavery in 1846 in Tunisia. Um, and so despite this abolition, this, this vanguard act of abolition did not really prompt an emancipation uh, period that took into consideration the socioeconomic disadvantages of freed slaves vis-a-vis the rest of the population. So eventually um, it maintained like a remarkable stability in underlying norms and material conditions best reflected in this manipulation of many black Tunisians into oppressive, um, non-compensated symbolic labor today as clients for the offspring of their uh, ancestors, uh, former masters. Um, and at least in the South of the country, patronage relationships survived for quite a long time as a, an informal institution of slavery where free slaves found it difficult to extricate themselves from um, various relations of domination. Um, such entanglements, I argue, 
have further crystallized the long-running prejudice about, you know, Black Tunisians or Black North Africans, uh, especially like in society where patronage re remained, um, this kind of connotation of prejudice about their interrupted kinship and absence of lineage uh, in society where lineage matters, um, as their proximity to their owners um, thwarted any attempt to social or for social mobility or opportunities to wash away the, the stigma of the past. So even when you know, they were able to ascend the social ladder, their ongoing connection with, with previous masters persisted to evidence their slave descent. Um, and the state has an important role, of course, here, because at least in the 1970s, during the period when, you know, the modernization period after independence, um, the, the state um, issued, of course, uh, you know, they, they started basically thinking about more like regimentation of the post-colonial subject and they, uh, um, started actually uh, this project of like last name project. And so they ended up giving Black Tunisians last names that um, referenced or invoked their past uh, history of, of servitude in the country. So Black Tunisians held names like Abid, uh, like Pati, meaning freed slave, um, and even had last names that um, invoked or um, gave a mention to the previous, uh, you know, uh, slave masters of that particular family. So basically, Blacks, when they didn't wither in racial and marginality, they became an accessory um, auxiliary to like historically slave owning families um, who depended on, on the former's presence to reinforce these codes of honor and foreground the history of domination and so on and so forth. Um, but also, you know, through the state, um, you know, they remained also attached uh, in the collective imaginary um, through various, I guess, um, processes and that the state uh, um, um, I, I undertook. So I want to conclude by saying basically that to go back again to this question of language, um, although it was enhanced by this extensive kind of borrowing from Western encoded meanings of uh, Black otherness, uh, pre-modern significations of the concept of, of Blackness today sort of resist uh, this discursive obsolescence in in, in uh, like a fastly shifting and a dynamic language. So the predominant descriptors and epithets of overtly like invoked uh, the, you know, that overtly invoked the history of trans-Saharan Arab slavery more so than the transatlantic counterpart and its global racial heritage today, um, sort of, um, and, and then there is this, you know, these terms that I'm mentioning here are um, ubiquitous and, are reflective of the material reality of, of many Black groups in North Africa. Um, and so what I'm trying to say basically is that the, the, the project of looking at like discursive practices of language isn't merely like an abstract project, but actually it is urgent in the sense that it's, it should tell us and, and it should be used as an archive that um, reflects actually uh, and tells us and gives us, uh, and give us like a window to the extent to which certain groups, you know, uh, were able to integrate or not within a particular society, especially for Black people in, in, in North Africa um, uh, and the Middle East in general. Thank you. Ah, thanks very much, uh, Afifa, for sharing your thoughts. I think this, uh, the, the whole issue of linguistics and language itself, it's, it's, it's so, so critical in terms of the way terms have been used. Uh, but uh, let's move on and let's get to Professor Moses Ochono. I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly, Professor, yes. who is uh, Cornelius, who is at Van uh, where he's a professor of history, he has written a few books uh, pertaining to African studies, of course, and uh, whilst he might have an interest specifically in, in Nigeria, his uh, interest has been uh, across the continent. I've just seen a recent article by him on xenophobia in South Africa, which I found very interesting. And so we shall uh, hand over to you and here you are. Thank you very much. All right, All right. thank you, Professor Harun. Um, so as a, as a historian, I am interested in accounting uh, for origins and sources. For me, it is important that any effort to understand or explain contemporary anti-Black racism in the Arab world is faithful to the historical processes that produced and normalized that racism. On the weight of the historical evidence documented in both primary and secondary sources, 
we can say authoritatively that the enslavement of Black Africans across the Sahara and Indian Ocean corridors is the bedrock of Arab anti-Blackness. Saharan and Indian Ocean slavery produced and legitimized the constellation of discriminatory attitudes, devalu uh, devaluing epithets and institutional exclusions that we now describe under the analytic rubric of Arab anti-Blackness. These slave trades produced, uh, this slave trade predated the Atlantic slave trade by several centuries. Therefore, by the basic law of chronological historical causality, neither the trades themselves nor the anti-Blackness that they authorized and democratized in the Arab world could have resulted from Euro-American Atlantic enslavement, from colonial racism, or from the resulting global intertwinement of white supremacy and capitalism. I say this to challenge the increasingly prevalent argument that anti-Blackness in the Arab world maps onto and overlaps or overlapped with the global accent of white supremacy as a political and economic hegemony. In Atlantic slavery studies, and I'm not an expert, but I've read quite a bit in that area, there is an axiomatic saying that goes something like this. Racism did not produce slavery, but rather slavery produced racism. The simple meaning of it is that from the perspective of, of enslavers, once the Atlantic slave trade commenced, enslavement authorized and necessitated a justificatory ideology for enslaving Africans. Racism anchored on religious claims and on the plethora on the production of devaluing sociological and ethnological knowledge about Africans provided that justification. Ideas of racial su superiority and inferiority were invented and enunciated over time and became part of the social and intellectual fabric of the enslaving societies. Social attitudes of anti-Blackness followed as this slavery-induced racism became normalized and as people growing up in those societies became socialized into the popular anti-Black racist tropes of their societies. I would argue that this explanation for the historical evolution of racism applies to anti-Blackness in the Arab world as well. Much like the Euro-Atlantic context, much like in the Euro-Atlantic context, the, contentions, the contention here is not that Arabs have always been racist against Black Africans. The point rather is that once the Saharan and Indian Ocean slave trade took root, along with their economic benefits, there was a, a persistent need, not just for generating, but also for reinforcing the racial justification for it. This is, as in the, the later Atlantic case, uh, required, uh, this, this, this process required the production of religious, sociological, and ethnological knowledge on a vast scale to bolster claims of Arab superiority and black inferiority. The other thing to note is that long before the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade and its imbrication in post-enlightenment white supremacy, Arab philosophers, geographers, and travelers wrote extensive commentaries on black African societies and kingdoms that they observed. These writings are filled with the casual, normalized anti-black racism that are today commonplace in the Arab world. I, I, in my presentation, I have a lot of examples, but I'm not going to read them because I feel like I would be preaching to the choir, which I do not want to do. Uh, but the, the most famous example is uh, Ibn Khaldun in his iconic uh, canonical work, Mukadma. And there, there are several other Arab Persian scholars and philosophers uh, you know, that, are, that, that I, could, I could cite. But, um, you know, the, 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 the characterization of African societies, I would argue, were merely repeating the prevalent popular Arab descriptions of Africans as excitable, emotional, dirty, morally unclean, childlike, and to use Ibn Khaldun's own words, worse than dogs. <laughs> <laughs> 
now I'm going to skip this part uh, and then go to my next point. What we see in this uh, Arab and Persian textual anti-Black racism is that they reflected and reinforced existing anti-Black attitudes in the natal societies of the writers. Institutions and structures in those societies had already been established to police this racial hierarchy and reinforce anti-Blackness. Another thing is this, like European travelers' texts on African societies, Arab textual anti-Blackness was ambivalent. On the one hand, the writings remarked positively, positively on African natural resources such as gold. But on the other hand, the writings remarked, uh, on the other hand, they unleashed a maelstrom of textual dehumanization on Africans. The trope of backward, primitive, childlike, but naturally endowed Africans did not begin with European racists. It began with racist Arab writers. This ambivalent trope of dehumanization and resource-focused backhanded complement was amplified to new decibels in the period of the European encounter with Africa, beginning in the 15th century. Here is another point along those lines, along these lines. The Hamitic hypothesis or the Hamitic myth, which holds that black Africans are cursed or are, that they are a cursed race and that any civilizational accomplishment recorded in Africa, south of the Sahara, we are spearheaded by light-skinned people from the North, from North Africa and the greater Middle East was first developed in pre-Islamic and Islamic Middle East before it made its way to European, Christian, and secular colonial racist thought. And for those who are interested, I, can, I, have, a, I have a great source to recommend to you. It's an article written by William McKee Evans, uh, published in 1980 and published in the American Historical Review. Now, let me touch briefly on the theological aspects as I try to round up here. The search for origins cannot be complete without exploring the theological roots of anti-Blackness in the Arab world. Uh, for this, this we, ha we have to do this with uh, two things in mind. Number one is that the canons themselves, the Islamic canons in and of themselves or in their immanent inherent quality do not shape ideologies. Rather, uh, ideologies, instead emanate from the realm of exegesis and interpretation in the domain of theological production. So that's what we try to reference when we you know, talk about how generations of Muslim clerics and regular Muslims in the Arab world mobilize theological opinions and make theological claims to justify uh, this, a subordinate status for black people or to justify their own racism against black people. And we are not picking on uh, the Islamic texts either. I come from Nigeria and I can give you two examples of religious texts or religious practices that also dehumanize and exclude people and negatively differentiate certain people from mainstream Nigerian society. The two examples that I like to give are the Usu caste system in Eastern Nigeria and the Higi system uh, in Northeastern Nigeria. These two systems were founded on religious beliefs and religious uh, perception of the idea of untouch untouchability, all right? So I'm going to just uh, go to my concluding phase since I'm aware that time uh, is running out and we need time for Q and A. So I'm going to now talk about why it is important, this, this accounting, this full accounting, full, honest, transparent accounting is important. So let me stress the polyvalent importance of rendering a full historical account for anti-blackness in the Arab world. I believe that such a historical reconstruction has to display fidelity to the intertwined aftermaths and legacies of slavery and of theological mobilizations to justify claims of black inferiority and Arab superiority. As I stated in a recent Research Africa discussion, I am not a stickler for, ter stickler for terminology. Call the foundational event of enslavement by whatever name you prefer. I really do not care. My main concern is to ensure that in trying to understand anti-Blackness in the Arab world, 
we account for its two main origins, practices of enslavement and their legacies on one side, and theological claims about a divinely ordained racial slavery, slavery and racial subordination. Any explanation or designation that erases the self-identity of culpable and complicit agents and the religious claims they mobilize to promote anti-Blackness is, in my opinion, intellectually dishonest, escapist, and unacceptable. Secondly, at a time of increasing gestures towards South-South intellectual and political alliances, the lingering racist legacies of enslavement across the Sahara and Indian Oceans stand, uh, Indian Ocean stand in the way of true solidarity. Only an honest, unfettered conversation on this issue will remove this obstacle. Thirdly, this is the age of decoloniality in the social sciences and the humanities. Our efforts to decolonize Africanist and non-Western knowledge entails dissolving historical processes and hierarchies of oppression, superiority, and devaluation. If this is the consensual premise of decolonial epistemology, then there is no intelligible reason why Arab enslavement of Africans and its legacies should not be subjected to the microscope of decolonial critique. Fourthly, as the African Union reimagines itself through the African Free Trade Agreement, as a bulwark against the ravages of neoliberal globalization, any historical practices and modes of negative differentiation that undermines the intra-African mobility of bodies and commodities must be challenged in intellectual and polit in the political and intellectual realms. Fifthly, Black Lives Matter and the important dialogues that it has provoked on racial matters should, as a matter of intellectual honesty, be extended to other geographic and temporal arenas where Black lives have not mattered, have been devalued and rendered invisible, and where complaints about this invisibility is often met with denial and deflection. I close with three interrelated cautionary notes. Critiques of anti-Blackness in the Arab world should neither reproduce nor amplify Orientalist and Islamophobic themes and tropes. Additionally, even as we challenge the historical and contemporary foundations of anti-Blackness in the Arab world, we should not do so in ways that complicate and undermine the long running struggles of internal Black populations in the Arab world for equality and acceptance. At the same time, the emotional and rhetorical blackmail of Islamophobia and Orientalism should not be advanced to shut down legitimate conversations on practices and attitudes that victimize and marginalize black people in the Arab world. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Professor Moses. You've really summed up those uh, important points at the end. I think uh, many of us would identify uh, with those. Uh, having said that, let's sort of open it up uh, now. There have been already a few questions uh, in the chat group. Um, uh, so, I feel yeah. that you want to. to yeah, um, I don't, I'm not sure if I understood the question really well, but I will try to answer because, I mean, from what I've understood is that, um, I mean, for me, at least when I think about, you know, the different groups in uh, North Africa, Black groups, there is always this conflation of, um, of, of the history of origin of two groups in, in North Africa the ones who uh, were historically never displaced and others who were historically dis you know, displaced, coercively displaced through the Trans-Saharan Arab slave trade or the, the you know, Ottoman slave trade. And so I think it's important to, to recognize that there was a process of uh, amalgamation that took place historically where all groups or black groups um, were conflated as one group of a slave descent. And so many um, black North Africans today uh, try to quite distance themselves from this conversation about race because they and, and anti-blackness because they 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 feel that that somehow implies that they are touched by these uh let's say um historical uh inaccuracies and so it's it's important to acknowledge that there are groups who claim uh a non-slave uh, descent 
And there are, uh, you know, historians who wrote about this, like, you know, Tunisian historian, Lergish, um, Abdelhamid Lergish, rather, and Ines Murad, and all. Uh, they wrote a lot extensively in French, especially. Um, yet, the, the, the tendency is that um, people tend to think about Black groups as descendants of slaves um, without necessarily um, thinking about the fact that, you know, Blackness is supposed to be at least like an indigenous tenant to, to Africa and that it shouldn't, shouldn't be actually constructed in such a way that uh, uh, de um, depresses its natal claims to that geographical location. Um, so yeah, definitely the Harati, for instance, historically were never enslaved or at least were never displaced. They were enslaved, uh, but they, or many, some of them, but many of them uh, were never displaced. Um, they were always in um, sort of, they, 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 they weren't um, forced to move outside of their um, original uh, home or anything like that. Um, same for Black Tunisians or uh, Black, um, uh, or like, for, you know, I don't know, for, I mean, for Nubians, I guess it's also a different conversation, but I can't speak much to the, to the Nubian question, but um, yeah. The okay, thank, thanks, Afifa. Uh, uh, Moses, if you want to uh, have your um, share some more thoughts on, on these and, and other aspects and some of the questions that have been posed. Yes, I, I see a question. Moses? If I could, yes. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, please. Yes, if I, I see a question about the, I think it's from uh, Rahul. And it's about, Rahul, yeah. it's a broad up question mm -hmm. about, you know, Africans, when Africans became Muslims, when the Muslim population in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I hate to use that term, but for, for convenience, I'll use it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that did that did that in any way uh, mitigate anti-blackness in the Arab world because of the shared religious solidarity? I think that's what, she's, uh, that's, that's what the question is about. And I, I would say that historically, we haven't seen the evidence, they, you know, it is possible, but just the evidence doesn't exist to make that kind of argument and uh, to say that, if anything, I would say that over the centuries uh, after Islam was introduced across the Sahara and across, you know, obviously in uh, East Africa, uh, on the Indian Ocean Corridor, if anything, I think the, 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 the attitude of Arabs towards Africans, you know, kind of um, degenerated into more uh, feelings of superiority on their part and into devaluing Africans. And that may be because of encounter and familiarity. You know, there's the old English saying that familiarity sometimes breeds contempt. So I think familiarity in this case and interactions on a vast scale over a long period of time uh, may have actually exacerbated this uh, attitude that we're speaking about. The final thing I'm going to say is that there's a really good book that I think helped me make my, make my case even further, which is that over the years, as more and more Africans have become Muslim, that instead of abating, this attitude of anti-Blackness has actually quite um, increased, is Usman Khan, Usman Khan's uh, latest book, uh, Beyond Timbuktu. There's a chapter in it where he talks about the attitudes of uh, Arabs, Arab Muslims towards African Africans studying in the Holy Land in Saudi Arabia, students, but also pilgrims. And, and there's, a, there's a whole chapter there that he talks about the racism that was, uh, that's, was and this was in the 70s, 1960s and 70s. So mm -hmm. I think if anything, I would say that there's a, there's a genealogy there that's what I want can trace that, you know, actually, uh, as, as, uh, that actually points to this correlation between the rising number of Muslims in Africa and the increasing uh, anti-Black racism in the Arab world. And I'm not an expert in it, so I can't offer a full explanation for why that is the case. But I, I hope that I, some experts can take it up and help us to understand that that negative correlation. Thank you. Mm. Thank, thanks, uh, Moses. Let me just sort of allow one more question by Professor Ngom, who would like to uh, ask a question. Professor Ngom, I mean, you. I, I know our time is basically almost up. Uh, yeah, just, I just one. Uh, I just Please. wanted to ask a very quick question, and I. Uh, Thank you all for organize, organizing this uh, important event. My question is uh, the big elephant in the room was touched on by uh, Moses, and that is the uh, 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 theological dimension. How do we deal with uh, canonical books like um, Wata uh, by mm -hmm. Imam Malik that uh, 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 legislate uh, 
uh, slavery and justifies transactions of you know uh, girls and boys uh, from Africa that continue to be used in uh, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, including in Mauritania. How do we deal with that? That's, that's I think, uh, my question. And are there any effort in the Arab world that uh, uh, involve in revisiting the theological text? Because I think at the end, this is really the issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, no, uh, yeah, I think uh, a wonderful question. I think uh, it is just that it's a pity that our time is basically run out, but. I think uh, being a theological uh, issue and of course tied to the theological text and people like uh, the, uh, uh, Imam Malik, I think they, they, there's a need to explore those. Like uh, Moses indicated, I mean, when you look at Ibn Khaldun too, uh, that sort of issue is also somewhat tied up in his uh, sort of text that, that he had written. So I think um, there's a need for further exploration and perhaps maybe taken up at, uh, uh, a bit later. And, but just, just a, a quick question. I mean, of course, we, sp we spoke about the Nubians and so forth. What about the Berbers? I mean, uh, to what extent has sort of has been the anti-Berber sort of attitude amongst Arabs? I mean, uh, maybe Afifa, you, you might be able to share some light on that. Honestly, when it comes to this question of uh, black people um, and basically the question says, to what extent are the black people of the Maghreb conflated with the Amazigh of the same region? I would say that uh, black people do not have the same strong claims to the region uh, like the Amazigh. Uh, the Amazigh still hold that, you know, um, are attached to this um, maybe idea of being the indigenous people of North Africa. And so they're, you know, so it's never been, it was never been like a, a similar process of alienation, I would say. Um, and the second question, how much uh, has Arab Islam culture and ideology affect influences or anti-black racism, even when the Maghribian blacks are Muslim? I think it's been used strategically to um, uh, to stunt conversations around this this question because um, there, there has been always this uh, ex excessive regurgitation of the example of Bilal, for instance, and other you know black uh, um, uh, black figures in Islam to um, numb or to um, manipulate a certain uh, you know black people who will talk about anti blackness and would like to maybe bring that issue to the surface. And so I would say that this is, uh, this is I think the relying on this question of the black Muslim has been always used strategically, um, you know, to, to manipulate more so than to, uh, or to kind of numb uh, uh, these sentiments of, of alienation and estrangement. Um, what was the last part? I'm sorry. Is well, I was, one? yeah, I think maybe uh, our time has gone. So, and I apologize for our participants as well as, um, our presenters, but uh, let me sort of use the opportunity just to thank each and every one of you, and particularly Duke University for having sort of created this particular platform. And like uh, our colleague Wendy indicated, maybe there should be a sequel. And that I leave with uh, our colleague Julie and and Amanda and Meredith basically to, to think uh, about. Julie, over to you. I think we would love to sponsor a sequel. Um, maybe Dr. Lowe and I can can talk to the talk to that. And this was exceptional. So thank you all for being here for your incredible questions and to the panel for being with us tonight today. Thanks to Dusig's Ames and the John Hope Franklin Center for Sp Center for sponsoring today's talk. Join us on March third for Girl Talk: The Inclusion of African American Women Pianists in Standard Piano Literature as our Wednesday at the Center, John Hope Franklin and Global Anti-Racism series continues. Stay safe and see you all soon.